properties. Wayne Espinal Unit, Tandem Sla Plata Unit. Development of the Upper Colorado River from 1950 to 2000. This is the 11th of a monthly series as we build towards Reclamation's 120th anniversary on June 17th, 2022. This event is being recorded. If you are not interested, please disconnect at this time. If you're having technical issues, uh, please disconnect and join again. Additionally, you may have better success connecting to the team app on your computer and not in the web browser. If you have a question, please click on the bubble in the upper right hand corner. We'll do our best to answer questions at the end. At this time, I would like to introduce Reclamation's senior historian, Dr. Andrew Gahan. Andrew? Thank you, Peter, and thank you all for joining us. Today, we are going to look at what Reclamation was doing developing water resources along the Upper Colorado River. From 1950 to 2000, Reclamation constructed over 25 dams in relationship to the Colorado River Storage Project alone. But the development of the Upper Colorado River resources also included two large intricate trans-basin projects, the Col Colorado Big Thompson Project and the Frying Pan Arkansas Project. All were constructed to allow the upper basin states to utilize their share of the Colorado River based on the 1922 Colorado River Compact. After the end of the Second World War, the activities of the Bureau of Reclamation moved at an accelerated pace. The multiple purpose concept had been refined and began to include other benefits, such as recreation and fish and wildlife concerns. This broadened project features and a robust construction regiment are representative of the large dam building era that began with the construction of Hoover Dam in 1931. In addition, they reflected the influence and desires of, of a society and communities throughout the West, becoming more urbanized and industrialized, encompassing the ideals, ideals embodied in that transformation. So let's do a quick review. During the 1920s and 1930s, the focus of the development of the resources of the Colorado River occurred primarily in the lower basin. The 1922 Colorado River Compact sought to provide some measure of equity by designating upper and lower basin allotments and ensuring that the upper basin where most of the water originates delivered water to the lower basin. With this agreement in hand, Congress passed the Boulder Canyon Project Act that called for the construction of Hoover Dam and set lower basin allocations. This was soon followed by the construction of the All-American Canal and the Parker and Davis Dams. Along the Upper Colorado River watershed, reclamation was very active. Notably, notable early projects included the Grand Valley Project and the Ucompagre project. And as we've mentioned in earlier presentation, presentations, reclamation activities took off during the Great Depression. While larger projects like Boulder Canyon, Columbia Basin, and Central Valley received the lion's share of attention, numerous smaller projects made up the bulk of reclamation's construction efforts including the Mancos and Pine River projects along the upper Colorado River. By far the most impactful and perhaps influential project connected to the upper Colorado River was the Colorado Big Thompson project. Investigated, discussed, and argued over for decades in Colorado, the CBT marked a definite change in how water boosters looked at and design projects. The CBT showed that of defined river basins were not obstacles to development and that moving river, river, river resources to where it was most needed exemplified human's ability to alter nature to meet the needs of society. Reclamation would repeat this model throughout the West, but no more so than in the upper Colorado River watershed. 
With its focus on the lower basin, however, reclamation had paid little attention to the upper basin's needs regarding the entire Colorado River. Of course, with the notable exceptions, as I just mentioned, of the Colorado Big Thompson Project, which in its own way foreshadowed the direction future upper basin development would take. The general sentiment prior to World War II was that there was little need in the upper basin to utilize this resource. However, the demographic growth as a result of the war altered those perspectives. Under the catchy subtitle of, quote, a natural menace becomes a natural resource, end quote, the Bureau of Reclamation produced a plan that outlined full utilization of water resources throughout the entire Colorado River Basin in 1946. All reclamation proposals were governed by compact requirements. Foremost was ensuring annual deliveries of 7.5 million acre feet to the lower basin, along with individual allocations among the upper basin states. In 1948, the upper basin states signed the Upper Colorado River Compact, establishing, establishing state allotments which permitted reclamation to formally investigate and plan for upper basin development. Wasting little time, Reclamation proposed the Colorado River Storage Project in 1950. It called for the construction of 10 reservoirs, participating projects to open an estimated 300,000 acres of new land for irrigation and development of water resources on Indian lands. At the rather impressive 1950s cost of $1.5 billion. Initial planning proposed the construction of four large storage units that would allow the upper basin to fulfill its delivery, delivery obligation to the lower basin states, along with hydroelectric production to help fund participating projects. These dams were euphemistically termed cash register dams, and their revenues were, would create the Upper Colorado River Development Fund. Similar to the Pick Sloan Missouri Basin Program, the Colorado River Storage Project is a prime example of reclamation's turn to river basin developments where all the units are interconnected. Now, it did not take long for the proposal to gain attention and attract opposition. Two of the dams reclamation initially proposed were located in Dinosaur National Monument, Echo Park, and Split Mountain. The National Park Service objected to the Dinosaur Dam site plans and opening a public feud within the Department of the Interior. The Park Service was quickly joined by an array of conservation groups denouncing reclamation's plans to construct dams within the National Monument. Through successful and innovative tactics, the opposition delayed project op authorization for six years. Their only goal was protecting the sanctity of national parks and monuments from development. Their efforts garnered strong public support and helped to place and helped to place con sorry, <laughs> and helped to place conservation into the national conversation. In 1956, Reclamation removed the dinosaur dam sites from, from the project and conservation groups withdrew their opposition. And as a side note, many historians have suggested that this episode was the start of the modern day environmental movement. On April 11th, 1956, Congress authorized construction of the Colorado River Storage Project. Legislation called for the construction of four units, Glen Canyon, Flaming Gorge, Navajo Dams, and the Curaconte unit. It also authorized 15 participating projects, and these were primary, primarily irrigation projects, but also contained some M&I and recreational benefits. Some were long-term, and trans-basin diversion projects, such as the Central Utah Project, the San Juan Chama Project, 
and the Navajo Indian Irrigation Project. Construction began almost simultaneously on Glen Canyon, Flaming Gorge, and Navajo dams in 1956. With the start of construction efforts, reclamation began an enterprise which would last into the start of, of the new century. The Wayne Aspinall units, or Curacanti, were the last primarily storage units to be constructed under the Colorado River Storage Project. The unit consisted of three storage dams in the state of Colorado designed to regulate the flows of the Gunnison River, a tributary of the Colorado River. Work began in 1962 with the construction of Blue Mesa Dam, a 390-foot earth fill structure 30 miles downstream from Gunnison, Colorado. It was completed in 1966. In 1963, Reclamation began building Morrow Point Dam, Reclamation's first thin arch double curvature dam, completed in 1968. The final facility construction constructed was Crystal Dam, another double curvature thin arch dam, which began in 1972 and was completed in 1977. Along with storage and regulation responsibilities, all three dams had associated power, power plants with a combined generating capacity of 161,467 kilowatts. Power was delivered to load centers in the Colorado River Storage Project market area and connected to the transmission systems from Glen Canyon and Flaming Gorge power plants. Similar to other Colorado River Storage Project units, power revenues produced at these facilities would help fund participating projects. The Aspinall units were, in short, cash register dams. In 1980, the Curacanti unit was renamed the Wayne Aspinall unit in honor of former Colorado Congressman Wayne Aspinall. Aspinall was a seminal figure in the history of water resources development in the American West and shares that distinction with other luminaries, including F.H. Newell, Elwood Mead, Floyd Dominey, and Senator Carl T. Hayden from Arizona. Aspinall grew up in Palisades, Colorado, and served Colorado's 4th Congressional District from 1941 to 1973. In 1959, he became chairman of the House Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs, a position he held until 1973. Highly protective of Colorado's water rights, Aspinall influenced the shape of the Colorado River Storage Project. And it has been claimed that no reclamation project ever left the Interior Committee without the blessing of Wayne Aspinall. In 1983, Colorado Governor Richard Lamb acknowledged Aspinall's influence by claiming, quote, you can't take a drink of water in Colorado without remembering Wayne Aspinall. The Colorado River Storage Project primary storage units satisfied the upper basin's obligation to deliver water to the lower basin as required by the 1922 compact. But it was the participating projects that allowed the upper basin to fully develop Colorado River resources. And as mentioned earlier, some of these were large scale, long term projects, which even today, reclamation remains intimately involved like the Central Utah Project to bring Colorado River water to the Bonneville Basin, or the San Juan Chama Project that diverted San Juan River water into the Rio Grande watershed to serve the m &I needs of Albuquerque, New Mexico. There was also the Navajo Indian Irrigation Project to provide irrigation and m &I water to the Navajo Nation. Most, however, were small to medium-sized projects that served the irrigation and municipal needs of rural communities. All these projects had very similar characteristics. They primarily provided supplemental water for irrigation. 
These projects also proved useful in augmenting municipal water supplies when needed and added to the area's economic vitality by expanding recreational benefits. Almost from the beginning of federal reclamation, these local communities associated with the Colorado River Storage Project's participating projects had long sought reclamation's help constructing these projects but feasibility issues hampered development. All had been on Reclamation's radar, but it was only until the creation of the Upper Colorado River Development Fund and the assistance received from hydropower revenues that there was any chance of them becoming remotely feasible. Even with this financial aid, many barely had a positive benefit cost ratio. For example, Reports on the Smith Fork project in Colorado estimated the project would cost $2,000 per acre. But because of the development fund, water users were charged about $860,000 $860, out of a total cost of $3.3 million. Geography also played a part in the tenuousness of these projects. Most sat at high altitudes with short growing seasons that limited crop potential to alfalfa grains and grasses to support livestock, produ livestock production. These were not the types of high value crops to stimulate growth and encourage new development, but they were representative of the type of farming that had been conducted in the Colorado River's upper basins for decades. And reclamation development did much to stabilize and enhance area economies. But by the 1960s, as federal budgets tightened, these aspects led to greater scrutiny into and criticism of reclamation activities. Reclamation was also beginning to feel the weight of a transformation taking place in American society, especially in the West. Reclamation activities were not immune to these changes and began to encounter new attitudes in American thought and culture. What I've often referred to as an environmental consciousness was emerging that was reconsidering humans' relationship to the natural world. In addition, Native American issues were gaining greater attention and Indian tribes were becoming more assertive in the protection of their water rights. And these issues read head on into long held Western beliefs on full development of water resources. Theirs essentially was a use or lose mentality. Develop projects or lose the water. Reclamation would feel the effects of these opposing views as it sought to perform its mission under new parameters. So let's start with the environment. The United States experienced an unprecedented economic boom after World War II that lasted well into the 1960s. And this opened new opportunities for most Americans, providing higher standard of livings and allowing greater mobility. As a result, Americans went out to explore the great outdoors and developed deep appreciations for the nation's natural wonders. This translated into reforms and new policies on how the federal government operated. Reclamation faced increasing stringent requirements to mitigate the effects of project development on fish and wildlife and water quality. New legislation added new components to feasibility studies and allowed, and allowed the public to comment on project proposals. All added substantially to project costs and construction delays. Now, the history of Indian irrigation is very complicated and a topic worthy of its own examination. Nevertheless, the Colorado River Storage Project brought new attention to the issue of Indian water rights. To be frank, however, the federal government's record on protecting tribal water rights was poor and Reclamation's reputation working with Native American tribes had, had been less than stellar. Reclamation service efforts toward developing irrigation works for the benefit of Native peoples began 
on the Flathead, Fort Peck, Blackfeet, and Crow reservations not long after passage of the Reclamation Act. But these projects suffered from funding deficiencies and bureaucratic bickering between, the rec between Reclamation and the Office of Indian Affairs. None were completed by Reclamation, and the Indian Service took over irrigation development on all Indian reservations from Reclamation in 1924. The history of Indian water rights can be narrowed down to two important Supreme Court decisions. In 1908, the, the court issued what became known as the Winters Doctrine that established the principle of reserved rights. Very simply, a reserved right vests an Indian tribe with a water right that dates to when the federal government established the res reservation and remains in effect whether or not the water is put to beneficial use. In the arid West, where the principle of prior appropriation reigned supreme, the court's ruling meant that most Indian tribes had a priority right over non-Indian farmers and communities. In 1964, the court in Arizona v. California ruled that Indians were entitled to enough water to irrigate, quote, practically all irrigable acres, end quote. This rather ambiguous statement strengthened the reserved right principles and sent tremors throughout the arid West. In 1965, Reclamation began construction of the Frying Pan Arkansas Project with the construction of Rudai Dam on the Frying Pan River in Colorado. A slightly smaller version of the CBT, the Fry Arc project transfers water from, Colorado, from the Colorado River to supply irrigation and municipal, <clears throat> and municipal water to farms and communities along Colorado's Front Range. The project consists of six dams and reservoirs, 16 diversion structures, and nine tunnels of a combined length of 26.7 miles. Although not associated with the Colorado River Storage Project, I have to at least mention the Fryar Project because of its breadth and scope, but more importantly, its role in the development of Upper Colorado River. It is a massively important reclamation project that showcased all of Reclamation's skill, resources, and ingenuity. Now, despite evidence that the nation's economy was showing signs of stress, Congress passed the Colorado Basin Project Act in 1968, the last large reclamation authorization of the 20th century. Promoted as a basin-wide development plan, the project centerpiece was the Central Arizona Project. It also authorized continued funding for the Central Utah Project and called for the construction of five projects in Colorado, Animas La Plata, Dolores, Dallas Creek, San Miguel, and West Divide. These Colorado projects were all designated participating projects under the Colorado River Storage Project to take advantage of funding assistance provided by the Upper Colorado River Development Fund. Although authorized in 1968, the Colorado projects had some difficult challenges to overcome. None were shovel ready when the legislation was passed and still required years before final plans were set. All would confront environmental reviews and challenges. All had questionable benefit cost ratios, in most cases, barely even breaking even receiving intense scrutinization from detractors. Questions of Indian water rights would enter the picture, and two projects, Animas La Plata and Dolores, contained plans to service Indian lands. And finally, all were affected by transitions taking place within reclamation. By the early 1970s, reclamation was beginning the transition to a water management agency an activity that came in fits and starts. Mostly, this was the result of large ongoing construction projects, 
many of which taking place in the upper, upper Colorado River Basin. But changes to reclamation also came in new responsibilities and priorities. The focus turned to greater awareness to environmental responsibilities, working with less traditional constituencies and broader oversight on project operations. Reclamation also began shifting into non-traditional areas. And this is best seen in the hiring of non-engineering staff, such as biologists, fishery experts, archeologists, and ecologists. And over time, these new professions would greatly impact reclamation's path and priorities. Nevertheless, trouble hampered the Colorado projects from the start. All required help from the Upper Colorado River Development Fund to attain any measure of feasibility. The San Miguel and West Divide projects were never construction, constructed because the economic feasibility could never be justified. In 1978, construction began on the Dallas Creek project in West Central Colorado. The project provides irrigation and MI benefits along with the development of recreational resources and was completed in 1987. And this was the easy one. In 1977, Reclamation began construction on the Dolores project in southwestern Colorado. It is a quintessential multi-purpose project, providing water for irrigation and MI purposes, in addition to hydropower production and recreational benefits. Project facilities were also designed to serve irrigation and MI needs on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation. Nevertheless, the project had the added notoriety of being included on the Carter hit list. It encountered funding issues caused by tighter controlled budget, federal budgets. All contributed to delays in construction and increased project cost. After almost 20 years of effort, the Dolores project was completed in 1998. By far the most contentious, the Animus La Plata project was the final Colorado project constructed. Originally proposed as a multi-purpose project providing irrigation, M&I, and recreational benefits, the plan, to divert the plan was to divert water from the Animus River to supplement supplies in the La Plata River Basin. The project received a substantial boost when it became designated an Indian American project. Project plans became key features of the 1988 Colorado Ute Indian Water Rights Settlement Act. However, lingering economic and environmental issues remained unresolved. In 2000, Congress passed the Colorado Ute Settlement Amendments affecting the Animus La Plata project. It removed all irrigation components to non-Indian lands while still providing m &I water to non-Indian communities. The settlement amendments appeared to remove all project obstacles and, con and construction began in April of 2002. While one could talk for hours about the story of the Animus La Plata project, let's just say that it is representative of all the features that characterize, characterized water resources development along the upper Colorado River during the second half of the 20th century. Severe budget restrictions affecting construction and environmental consciousness emerging throughout American society, questioning the very need for reclamation projects. Native American, indeed all minority grievances entered the mainstream discussion and influenced how, federal how the federal government responded to resource needs in the American West. Between 1950 and 2000, the Bureau of Reclamation encountered an ever-changing environment where perhaps to some it seemed as if the rules were always changing.
Nevertheless, for the Bureau of Reclamation, the work remained the same as it always had. The mission did not change. Reclamation's focus was still water and hydroelectric power development and delivery. And I, as, I, as I have suggested before discussing the water management era, construction never stopped. It just took on new characteristics and faced new challenges. I have also suggested that throughout the, its history, the Bureau of Reclamation has shown an incredible adaptability to changing circumstances. And perhaps development of the Upper Colorado River showcased that ability better than others. Thank you so much. That's all I have. Um, if you all have any questions, I will do my best to answer them as best as I can. Peter? Thank you, Andrew. If you have any questions, please submit them by clicking on the question icon in the top right part of your screen. I have a question to kick us off today. Um, you discussed it in the presentation, but can you go into a little bit further why it was important to develop hydropower um, on the facilities in the Upper Colorado River Basin? Yeah, that was, um, you know, that was kind of a, a long brewing concept that, that came out, I think, in the 1939 uh, Reclamation Projects Act. And it basically comes down to um, the irrigators' ability to pay. Um, as I mentioned, some of these projects had incredibly high per acre cost that these, these communities just simply, simply could not afford. And so the development fund helped them develop, uh, build these projects, or at the very least modify existing projects that the community had built in its own right. Um, and it helps stabilize these small communities. Um, like I mentioned, it in some cases it it allowed for the development of some M and I water to the for uh, for these communities. And I think the development of recreational uh, aspects um, was a benefit to these communities that they had not foreseen, uh, which um, you know added to their prestige and added to their economic viability. Thank you, Andrew. Um, one question, um, and just a reminder, if you have a question, please click on the comment bubble in the upper right-hand corner. Um, I know it was listed on one of your slides, but uh, you did not include the San Juan Chama project in your list of trans basin uh, projects in the, uh, on the Colorado River storage project. I just wanted to, they were just asking why that was not included. Actually, it was. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mentioned it. Let's let's okay. let's go. Let's go back. Or... Anyway, yeah. No, I, I think you mentioned it, but I don't think it was mentioned as a trans basin diversion. But could just be an oversight from the person. So okay, no problem. Um. What? So kind of putting your futurist hat on. <laughs> what do you think will be the future in the Upper Colorado River Basin and what implications will this past hold for our future? You know, I, I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, you know, first of all, we desperately need to figure out some way to fill reservoirs. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's pretty much out of our hands. Um, I, I, I think the implications of the development of the Upper Colorado River um, were even seen earlier uh, when we go back talking about to uh, trans basin projects. You know, the Colorado River holds a lot of sentiment. Um, it's it's you know a relatively dirty river, <laughs> so when you start moving water from one basin to another for like you know the Fry Fry Arc and CBT. You know, basically that water is going now going into the Mississippi River. Um, this uh, central Utah project, that water is going into the Great Salt Lake. And what has occurred in, you know, we don't, I mean, we're still working on it very much, is that the um, 
the alkalinity or the saltiness of the Colorado River, once it gets down to the lower basin, is an issue. And part of that issue is because water is being diverted. And, you know, I don't know what the answer is, <laughs> but I know uh, that the only way to really fix something like that is like when I said, we have to fill these reservoirs. <laughs> so, you know, I, it, it, it is an issue. I think it's probably the biggest issue when regarding development of the upper Colorado River, for me anyway, um, is the effect that it has on the entire river basin. Um, and we're talking about, you know, compared to other rivers within the United States, you know, the Colorado River isn't really that big but it's asked to do so much. <laughs> um, and, and so it's, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a sticky issue. Um, yeah, I hope I answered that. Okay, thank you. Um, could you go into uh, more into the environmental controversy concerning Glen Canyon Dam? Um, <laughs> this person mentioned, I don't know if you've heard the book, a story that stands like a dam. Yes. Um, so if you can go into a little more detail on the yeah. environmental controversy. Well, first of all, that's a great book. <laughs> I, I recommend that book to anybody that wants to, to, to understand uh, the story of uh, the building of Glen Canyon Dam. Um, it's funny, I talked, you know, I talked about um, the, uh, those uh, conservation groups that fought against the uh, the construction of the dams in um, in Dinosaur National Monument, and once Reclamation gave up on the dams and they you know they um, they chose the uh, Glen Canyon, Flaming Gorge, and the the Navajo dam sites along with the Currituck units, um, the conservation groups basically had no problems with those selections. The environmental controversy over Glen Canyon Dam came during the construction of Glen Canyon, when basically those folks, uh, those conservation groups actually went into Glen Canyon and were taking uh, river trips down the canyon and saw the, in their opinion, what was an incredible uh, ecosystem environment uh, within that canyon and their understanding that it was going to be destroyed by, by the dam and the reservoir behind it. The other thing that kind of ticked them off is that in the Colorado River Storage Project Act, um, the Bureau of Reclamation or the federal government uh, was mandated to protect, oh my gosh, oh shoot, oh it's hell to get old. Anyway, <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> it. It's okay, it's okay. Though. Yeah, it's okay. Anyway, it, it just turned into a, in, to a big environmental aspect of them trying to save the canyon um, against basically a development they don't they had if not agreed to acquiesce to um, and it uh, and in the final ends they actually tried to uh, convince um, uh, Secretary of the Interior Udall not to close the gates to Glen Canyon Dam once it was completed. But of course, we know what happened. He closed the gates, the reservoir filled. Um, but through all of that, and I know I'm doing a really poor job of explaining this, but through all of that, Glen Canyon becomes an icon in the, inter uh, in the in inter environmental movement, um, basically as a lost cause and, a, and an example to make sure that something like this would never happen again. <laughs> um, we had a question about it. someone asking about some any new large projects reclamation is working on for the 21st century. Um, it's beyond the scope of, of this project, but um, 
our, our presentation. So um, the, I'll reach out to the person directly and kind mm -hmm. of point them in a couple of directions. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question on um, sedimentation of these dams. Um, did you discover any engineering discussions on sedimentation in the rivers and reservoirs and what was planned to do with these dams once they do fill up with sediment? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, I know they're working on sedimentation problems. Um, the one that comes to mind uh, is in the, I hope I'm saying this right, the, the Paonia project. Um, on the Muddy River, there's a, there's a tremendous sediment issue on that particular uh, project that I know they're working on to, uh, to take care of. Um, yeah, the, that, you know, that's a, that's a huge issue on all the dams um, everywhere. <laughs> um, right. But, but, you know, I didn't come across um, any sorts of um, notices or something that would alerted me to the fact that um, anybody would have considered that particular issue a problem. Uh, in designing and developing these projects. And I know I know uh, on other projects that sentiment issues were taken into consideration in you know designing basically the height of a dam to to cover, you know, to you know make it uh, make its longevity better um, because they knew that sediment is going to fill up behind those dams. And I'm going to put a link into a news into the chat for everyone on a news release. Um, the Reclamation and USGS just completed a sedimentation study of of Glen Canyon Dam. Um, they updated kind of where it's at, so I just shared that with everyone in the Q and A with you, with them. Um, thanks for all the great questions. We got a bunch coming in. Um, we have a couple questions on Anum La Plata. Um, we're not able, I don't think, and Andrew, you don't know what the plans on delivery of water to the tribes for ALP is, do you? Or uh, probably. No. So you may want to take a look at the Anum La Plata uh, project website. Um, they have that information. The uh, Anum La Plata project was completed. Um, it was com uh, com completed um, in um, 2011 as the as the they started to fill Lake Nighthorse for the first time um, and it was transferred from construction status to uh, O&M status in March of 2013. Um, they were still working on some of the completions certifications but all that is available on the ALP website. Um, do you think it's possible that some of the projects that were never built will be reconsidered in the future? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I would think that, you know, a whole lot of other issues would have to be taken care of first. Um, you know, basically going back to what I said at the very beginning, figuring out some ways we got to fill the reservoirs we have already. Um, but it would depend. I mean, it, you know, these things, uh, these things uh, occur all the time. Um, it would depend on the, um, I think, on the community's efforts to, if they really, really want these projects uh, to be built. Uh, I think that would be the biggest consideration of, of all, um, and whether they could find, you know, the um, the backing within Congress to um, to authorize these projects. OK, um, one of the issues that's uh, affecting um, the Colorado River Basin at the upper part is the. Um, the salinity, uh, salinity issues uh, within the basin. Um, if you can kind of talk a little bit about that and. Possible to so kind of add the history of the Yuma desalting plant into that and how that might work. Uh, if that's if you're able to. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it's like I mentioned um, earlier when we, when we talked about um, the salinity issues with the Colorado River. It's uh, it's it's been an issue since development began. 
Um, they talked about uh, that particular problem in the early 1960s on early constructions of the of the Central Utah project, um, where the folks in Utah were becoming concerned that maybe their project might not get built because of that particular issue. Um, in regards to the um, the Yuma desalting plant, um, that you know, as we all know, that was constructed um, for the purpose of you know cleaning up the water that we delivered to Mexico, based on the 1945 treaty. Um, and that's you know, other than the fact that it's been um, on hot standby for the last I don't know 30, 40 years, <laughs> however long it's been built <laughs> since it was constructed. Um, yeah, I don't know what more I can add to that. Okay. Um, can you, if you're able to, and it's fine if you're not, um, talk about some of the environmental justice angles of how were disadvantaged people impacted by a Colorado River storage project? Uh, I think you addressed it a little bit in your presentation with regarding Native Americans, people of color, water users, environmental concerns, et cetera. Yeah. You know, I think I'm, I think I'm going to pass on that question. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think you talked about the kind of Native Americans impact yeah. on it um, in the presentation. Um, um, we had another suggestion for our book Encounters with the Arch Druid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good one, too. Yeah, that's um, basically for those folks who, who aren't familiar with that one. Um, basically, a journalist decided to go out and spend some time with um, David Brower, um, who was the former head of the uh, Sierra Club, and then he formed a, after he was fired from there, he formed another organization. But anyway, it was his journey with um, with David Brower, who he considered be the arch druid. Um, taking him to various places um, and discussing the environmental impact. Um, the, I guess the the final uh, the final section of the book deals with Brower and um, and Floyd Dominey taking a float trip down the Colorado River and both discussing their views on the development of the Colorado River. Uh, in regards to that, but the, you know that that's um, guys. You guys are really making me brush back some cobwebs <laughs> recalling some of these books. But it, 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 actually, it's it's an entertaining book. Um, okay. Um, we've. Can you talk about some of the kind of the history or evaluations if you've looked at this in the past? Um, there's been a lot of discussions about diverting the Mississippi or Missouri rivers into the Colorado River Basin. Um, any kind of past history on that or uh, I'm not sure there's anything in the future on that yeah. looking at that, but just some of the past in investigations. You know, I, um, I know there's been talk. Um, I know I've read some uh, uh, some documents that talk about doing that. Um, and, you know, I think as, you know, the biggest uh, detriment or problem with issue with that particular uh, proposal is the cost. You're going to be pumping water way uphill. I mean, you're starting from zero. <laughs> <laughs> on the Mississippi River, and you got a pumping it for miles, and you're pumping it uphill. Um, the the pumping cost would be astronomical, I think. Um, but you know, in regards to that, you know, similar types of proposal, it's it's interesting. I didn't bring it up in this presentation, um, but part of the um, uh, part of the discussion over the Colorado River Basin Project Act of 1968 um, included um, taking transfers from the Columbia River Basin, bringing that down into the um, 
into the Colorado River Basin. Uh, and lots of people proposed all sorts of plans. They, they too uh, were highly, uh, they were very expensive, uh, but for the most part, uh, the uh, congressional folks up in the uh, Pacific Northwest pretty much put a kibosh on any sort of transfer of waters. The best that the uh, folks um, in the Colorado Basin could get was um, uh, that there would be studies <laughs> to something like that, but there was nothing concrete. But yeah, it talks about augmenting uh, the Colorado River Basin have been going on at, at least since the 1960s. Um, and like I said, the, the, you know, something from uh, the Mississippi River, uh, the, the biggest the biggest issue was cost. Um, you know, it might have been easier, you know, if you wanted to, to divert it from the Missouri River. <laughs> at least you might be on, wouldn't have as much pumping cost. Anyway, I'm just speculating here. Okay, uh, last question, and, and we'll wrap it up here. To uh, wrap it up is um, Marble Canyon Dam. Um, are you familiar with that proposal? And if you can just um, talk a little bit behind the story of that one and why sure. that was never built. Sure. Um, Marble Canyon. Actually, there was two of them. There were uh, these were these were Marble Canyon and Bridge Canyon dams. They sat basically on the east and west ends. I think. It, yeah, more or less. Uh, the Grand Canyon National Monument. These dams were going to be proposed, but essentially these were cash register dams. These were dams that were going to supply power for the pumping of CAP water uh, for the Central Arizona project. Um, they were pretty much, what happened to them was pretty much the same scenario that occurred uh, when the dams were proposed at Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, environmental groups stood up, protested the construction of these dams, and once again, they were very successful at drawing attention to these dams um, and getting um, uh, holding up, uh, uh, you know, the the legislation for construction of the Central Arizona project. And eventually, in 1967-68, uh, once uh, Secretary Udall removed the dams. Uh, from the Central Arizona project. And for whatever reason, the conservation or environmentalists were perfectly content with them building a coal fire fired power plant, uh, uh, the, the Navajo power plant uh, in Page, Arizona, to basically power CAP pumping. Okay. Yeah. Um. Thank you to uh, Dr. Gahan for your presentation today. Um, I've had questions about the transcript. Um, if you would like to get a copy of that transcript, please send me an email at p, s as in Sam, o e t h, at usbr.gov, and we'll get you a copy of that transcript. Um, you can um, see the captioning of this uh, with the video. Uh, we will be posting this video on our intranet site, and it's still available at the link that you used to join us today. Uh, please join us on uh, May 26th. We will look at the history of uh, Grand Coulee Dam. Um, we have some interesting presenters there um, to look at the dam, not only from a perspective from reclamation, but we're working to have a, a person uh, present from the tribe on, on the history there. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you for, uh, for joining us uh, for this uh, history symposium.